We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, John Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, later today, I'll be visiting Forth Valley College in Stirling to open its new state-of-the-art uh, £20 million campus building. This cutting-edge facility is one of the most advanced premises in Scotland for the colleges and demonstrates this government's unwavering commitment to the college sector. Joanne Lamont. Astonishing when the definition of unwavering commitment is to cut their budgets by 20 per cent. However, so Nicola Sturgeon is the new Minister for Shovel Ready Projects and Alec Neil gets a hospital pass. But I have to say, as I look round the chamber, I see that not everyone is smiling. Not Jamie Hepburn, passed over for the crime of sticking to party policy on NATO. Kenny Gibson, never the bridesmaid, not even invited to the evening reception. <laughs> not so much rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, more swapping the mop heads on the vital spark. <laughs> but it's not just his backbenchers who are unhappy. So too is anyone in the country looking for a full-time job or any business looking for opportunities. Why has the First Minister reduced the ministerial responsibility for economic recovery to a part-time post? Why is running the National Health Service less important than running his referendum? First Minister. Uh, I, I can't believe that Joanne Lamont uh, put forward that uh, and accused somebody else of not smiling. <laughs> but let, 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 let's, let's deal with the college sector first. I, I've been looking at the massive capital investment programme in the Scottish college sector uh, in Dundee and Forth Valley and Kilmarnock and Inverness, uh, and now coming, of course, in the city of Glasgow, a £200 million. Yep. £200 million capital investment in the city yeah. of Glasgow Colleges. And I've been looking at what that does to the, the college budget current and capital over the next couple of years. It means that the college budget moves from £574 million yeah. to an expected, in 2014-15, £655 million. Pounds. Yeah. Uh, that means, uh, for example, a capital programme in that year of £184 million. Uh, in, Ten years ago, the Labour Party's capital programme in our college sector was £21 million. Oh. Oh. I'll just repeat that. £21 million. That is the extent of the, this government's commitment to the college sector around Scotland. Now, as far as the, uh, the government uh, changes are concerned, uh, can I say that Joanne Lamont is in a position that she has to select her shadow cabinet out with the ranks of MSPs. Yeah. Uh, but such is the dearth <laughs> of, of talent. I'm in the fortunate position yeah. that every single member of this government is focused on economic recovery in Scotland. Every single member of this government is focused yeah. on public services in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. And every single member of this government is looking to secure for this nation the economic and political powers we need to ensure a prosperous and just future. Joanne Lamont. I will there. never, ever apologise from drawing on the expertise of ordinary people across this country, including students who know what you are doing to the reality is. The gap between what the First Minister says is happening and what is actually happening on the ground is growing wider by the day. And ask any college principal that and that's what they'll tell you. So, however, let me get this right. In the morning, Nicola Sturgeon will deal with Scotland's biggest decision for 300 years. In the afternoon, she'll deal with the greatest economic crisis since the Depression in the 1930s. What on earth is she going to do for lunch? Split the atom. On Tuesday, the First Minister said there had never been an economic recovery without a recovery in construction. Yet, this is a man who cut £86 million from the housing budget, and now he has downgraded the Minister for Construction to a part-time job. How does he explain to someone looking for work that it's on Nicola Sturgeon's to-do list at some point when she gets past what she really cares about, which is the Constitution? 
First Minister. Well, uh, let's deal with the, the consequences of London rule over Scotland, supported by Joanne Lamont and her friends in the Conservative Party. The capital budget for Scotland, outlined by Alistair Darling, that is the capital budget that was to be deeper and tougher than the cuts of Margaret Thatcher, as Alistair Darling himself predicted, said that the capital spending in Scotland in real terms would reduce 37% between the years 2010-11 and 2013-14. After the munificence of this Conservative Liberal administration and their additions through the consequentials, that reduction has been reduced from 37% planned by Alistair Darling to 33.4% next year. Now, Joanne Lamont, can she make the possible connection between a 33% cutback in the capital budget and the consequences that has for people in Scotland. Does she not understand that almost 90% of Scotland's budget is currently controlled by Westminster? But can she possibly explain to the Scottish people why she wants to continue with a situation that Scotland (laughs) suffers from the cutbacks ordered by successive Tory and Labour chancellors? Joanne Lamont. The First Minister makes my case for me because if the Tories are attacking Scotland in the way that he does, why in the face of that does he not act as a minister focused on protecting the people of Scotland rather than focusing on the referendum? And if he wants to talk and if he wants to talk about working with the Tories, perhaps he better speak to his Westminster colleagues who I hear are saying that they're going to back the Tories in cutting the number of Scots MPs we send to Westminster. That will be that will be a case about representation. But the fact of the matter is the fact of the matter is the problem for the First Minister, the First Minister's problem is that his priorities aren't the priorities of the people of Scotland. Now, we know the First Minister is fond of quoting opinion polls. Let me quote one from one published this morning. Asked what subject they would raise with the First Minister, 68% of young Scots said jobs and the economy. Only 5% said the Constitution. Behind jobs, behind crime, behind the health service. And yet, the First Minister has downgraded jobs and the economy. He has placed less importance on hospital care, all at the expense of his obsession with breaking up the United Kingdom. Can the First Minister not see he is out of touch and doesn't care about jobs other than his own? First Minister. Uh, let's deal first with the health secretary. Order. Nicola Sturgeon was in post as Order. health secretary for five and a half years, more than twice as long uh, as anybody in the history of devolution, almost as long as Nye Bevan was in post, who founded the National Health Service, which is not a bad comparison, since yeah, Nicholas yeah. Sturgeon as Health Secretary yeah. restored the principle of, of health free at the point of need to the Scottish people. Under John Swinney's leadership on the economy, we have uh, jobs in Scotland which are a better employment rate a lower unemployment rate and lower inactivity than the rest of the United Kingdom. I think that's a considerable performance uh, against the restrictions of the Tory government at Westminster. But if Johan Lamont doesn't like Tory rule for Westminster, except of course when she shares platforms with the Tories across Scotland, then why on earth? Does she support the continuing exchequer rule over Scotland, which is forcing the cutbacks not just over the areas which we control, where we can try to give protection, but over the areas like welfare, where Westminster government is putting hundreds of thousands of Scottish Parliament of Scottish people into poverty? Why does Joanne Lamont support that kind of policy from uh, Westminster? And in terms of opinion polls. I thought the best opinion poll I saw over the summer was from that Labour Party affiliated organisation, the Fabian Society. They asked people in Scotland through YouGov what words they associated with the Labour Party. The top three, remember this is a Fabian Society poll, 
were out of touch, 35%, incompetent, 29%, and boring, 26%. Now, if that's what the Fabian Society thinks that people think of the Labour Party, what do the rest of the population think? John Lamont. The First Minister might want to reflect the fact that the people of this country do not think that his obsession with the referendum is their priority, and that's the biggest gap that he has to deal with. And if I was concerned about the health service, I don't think I'd be putting a man in charge of it who, in his current job in terms of the economy, presided over a slash in the housing budget and exported £700 million of money to boost the economies of China, Spain and Poland. Now, last May, Nicola Sturgeon was in charge of another campaign, a campaign to take over Scotland's biggest city. She made her campaign not about the priorities of the people of Glasgow, about, but about Glasgow being a stepping stone to independence. And she got roundly thumped. Yeah. Clearly, the First Minister has learned nothing from that. The people's priorities are jobs, paying their bills, putting food on the table, when in Salmon, Scotland, thousands of families now need food parcels. The First Minister cannot keep Scotland, the First Minister cannot keep Scotland on pause for the next two years. When will he realise it's not independence Scots families care about, it's the economy, stupid? First Minister. Uh, Order, given, given First I, Minister. I, I, I'm now in my fourth Labour Party leader uh, since 2007. I, I don't think Labour should talk about people getting thumped uh, in elections uh, in Scotland. <laughs> uh, they, they've had plenty. And as far as uh, Alec Neil is concerned, I, I think Alec Neil uh, epitomises the values of the National Health Service better than any member of the Labour Party in this yeah. Parliament, with a possible exception of Martha, Malcolm Chisholm, who unfortunately of course, was removed. Uh, as Health Secretary by the Labour Party. I think the Health Service uh, is safe in the hands of Alec Neil, as opposed to the Labour Party lying down to privatisation of the Health Service south of the border. Yeah. In terms of uh, Joanne Lamont's explanation of, of why people are happy with her alliance with the Tory Party, I, I don't believe that is universal uh, in the Labour Party ranks. Another former leader of Glasgow Council and former MSP Charlie Gordon says on Twitter, only halfway through the recession, jobless youngsters benefits threatened, devolution can't protect them, better together with the Tories. I think there are questions in the mind of Labour MSPs yes. as well as every Labour supporter in Scotland about the alliance that Joanne Lamont has taken with the Conservative Party front bench. Uh, and finally, back to the, the opinion poll uh, in terms of the Fabian Society. It wasn't all bad news for the Labour Party. They also had some expression that some people felt that the Labour Party in Scotland have, quote, plenty of ideas. That was 8%. <laughs> I have to say, I think that 8% is a massive figure, given the desultory negative performance of the Labour Party in this Parliament since 2007. Question number two, Ruth Davidson. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no immediate plans, but this very morning, David Mundell accepted the Deputy First Minister's request to meet with the Secretary of State, and I understand that meeting will take place next week. Ruth Davidson. Well, it's good to hear and good to see that the cheery bonhomie that's been going on and that we left off in June between the First Minister and the leader of the, the Labour Party has resumed. Um, we now know that the uh, Scottish Government is happy to sacrifice uh, a latter-day Nye Bevan on health uh, in the pursuit of the breakup of Britain. We've watched over the summer uh, higher education descend into chaos and, frankly, justice. Oh, yes. Order. Order. And, frankly, justice has been little more than an afterthought for the SNP. Yesterday... Mike Russell said that the SNP wants judged on its record. So let me ask the First Minister, for example, under the SNP, how many convicted killers and rapists have been released early? First Minister. 
We have, uh, as Ruth Davidson should know, the lowest crime rates in Scotland for over 30 years. And the reason we have the lowest crime rates in Scotland for over 30 years is we've got a thousand more police in the streets and communities of Scotland solving crime and making communities safer. Now, I, I don't understand this cheery bonhomie uh, that Ruth Davidson alludes to. The cheery bonhomie that I've been complaining about is the cheery bonhomie between Ruth Davidson yes. and the Labour yes. front bench. Yes. The people of Scotland watch that cheery bonhomie and are wondering, are the Tories turning themselves into the Labour Party or as more likely the Labour yes. Party turning themselves into yes. Conservatives? Yes. Uh, and as for the, the crisis in the university system in Scotland this year, yeah, the best funded universities in the continent of Europe yes. have a record number, a record number yes. of Scottish students going to university. In England, under the policies of Ruth Davidson's yes. party, yes. the numbers have collapsed by 25,000. Perhaps Ruth Davidson might inform the Chamber how she can possibly interpret a record number of university students from Scotland going to Scottish universities as anything other than an outstanding success for this administration and a total vindication of restoring free education yeah, to the yeah. Scottish people. Ruth Davidson, order. A truly stunning lap in the Blusterisk Olympics, but I asked about rapists and murderers. And the First Minister should have those figures. They should be in his book because they're government figures. 161 rapists, 277 killers. They're amongst the nearly 5,000 of the most violent people of our society being released early back on Scotland's streets since he came to power. We know the judges don't like it because Lord Ross has called it a charade. You're so keen today on opinion polls, we know the public don't like it because 95% of them oppose early release. And there is a simple remedy. The First Minister has even brought forward a victim's bill for this parliamentary session, but in it not a single word about automatic early release. So will the First Minister now act on the manifesto promises that he made both in 2007 and in 2011? Or is he personally content with these people roaming Scotland streets? Yeah. First Minister. For, for the political party which introduced early release in Scotland, yes, the Conservative Party introduced automatic early release in Scotland uh, under, I think, the tutelage of Michael Forsyth and Ian Lang, then why on earth do the Conservative Party not realise uh, that they should have some modesty in terms of the complaints about the criminal justice system in Scotland? The best thing about criminal justice in Scotland now is that criminals actually get caught. We have the best, we have the best statistics on solving crime for a generation. We have the lowest levels of recorded crime in a generation. And fear of crime is actually falling in Scotland, yeah. leading to the situation where the Home Secretary in England gets booed off the stage by the Police Federation, yeah. while the Justice Secretary in Scotland gets a standing ovation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Question number three, Willie Rainey. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, issues of importance to, to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Uh, we've just heard from Joanne Lamont that the health service and the economy are being deprioritised by the First Minister. Moving the most senior minister, his most senior minister, from health to independence. There's also a concern about the cost of focusing the civil service on making the SNP's case for independence. How many civil servants are working for that new Minister for Independence and how much is it costing? First Minister. Well, uh, some, somewhat less uh, than are working uh, in Downing Street trying to argue the case against uh, uh, the, the, the Scottish people. Uh, one thing I'd say to, to Willie Reddy is this, that uh, I think moving uh, somebody of Ayatli Neil's formidable talents uh, into the health service indicates and vindicates the strength and feeling of this party in favour of a, a national health service free uh, at the point of need. Would that the Liberals in England would resist the Tory attempts to dismantle the national health service in England? 
Secondly, every member of this government is focused on economic recovery. But every member of this government understands the inevitable conclusion that unless this country of Scotland gets control of our own resources, yeah. unless we are able to run the finances of Scotland, then the best we can do is mitigate the impact of Tory Liberal cuts from Westminster. There was a time in Scotland where members of the Liberal Party actually believed in genuine home rule, yeah. actually believed in controlling the finances yeah. of Scotland. Under the leadership of Willie Rennie and his immediate predecessor, that enthusiasm for genuine self-government disappeared. That's probably why they're reduced to a rump in this parliament. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Willie Rennie. He loves to bluster rather than answer the question. It's surprising. You don't even know how many civil servants are working on this and how much it's costing. In this summer, in this summer we learned that every civil servant had received training, not on boosting the economy or improving public services, but on how to keep information on independence secret <laughs> and how to criticise the UK. They laugh, they joke, but that's what's happening. His deputy, his deputy is paid by the taxpayer to run the SNP's independence campaign. With all the problems, all the problems facing our country, can it really be justified for taxpayers to pay her and devote so many civil servants to the SNP's cause? Come on, tell us. First Minister. I consider Willie Rennie's allegations preposterous and his interpretation of incidents fanciful. Not my words, but those of Alison Elliott, former moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, who had to respond to a similar ridiculous, nonsensical attack from Willie Rennie. Question number four, John Finney, order. Uh, to ask the First Minister what representations the Scottish Government has made to BBC Scotland following the announcement that there will be job losses at BBC Highlands and Islands and a reduction in the Gaelic News Service. First Minister. Well, the job cuts at BBC Scotland are extremely disappointing. Uh, this week, the Cabinet Secretary of Culture and External Affairs has written to the Director General designate at the BBC, George Entwistle, to make representations about the job losses, particularly those in news and current affairs and in Gaelic broadcasting. I'll be speaking personally with Mr Entwistle next week, but I'll make clear my concern on the impact of public sector broadcasting in Scotland. John Finney. Uh, I thank the First Minister for that answer. He'll be aware that BBC Alapa has been very successful in pooling and viewing figures of over half a million, despite the number of Gaelic speakers being fewer than 100,000. Does he agree with me that it's clear evidence that the people of Scotland are seeking out programming made in Scotland and that they want more productions to be made and shown here and that an independent public service broadcaster would help deliver this? First Minister. Yeah, yes, I, I do agree with that. And I, I think this chamber should be aware of the contrast between the funding cuts that are afflicting the BBC in Scotland, a 16% cut in funding from 102 million to 86 million, with this government's decision to protect the funding for BBC Alapa. Now, it would be of enormous concern, not just to me, but I hope to everybody in this chamber, if the reports in the Herald newspaper were true, uh, and that the BBC were intending to use the staff of the publicly funded BBC Alapa to cover for the cuts in Gaelic broadcasting being made in Inverness. Now, that would be, in my estimation, a very serious position uh, indeed, and I'll be putting that point directly to the Director General designate when I speak to him next week. David Stewart. Uh, Presiding Officer, does the First Minister share my concerns that with the removal of the news editor's job from the proposed Inverness establishment, there will then be no direction except from Glasgow for these services? That means BBC Highland News Agenda driven from Pacific Quay. Does the First Minister agree that the BBC's mission must be for the whole of Scotland, including rural and island communities, not just the central belt? First Minister. Yes, I, I do agree with that. And I hope David Stewart shares my concerns about the report in the Herald newspaper about the idea of taking journalist expertise from BBC Alapa to cover for cutbacks in BBC's own broadcasting. The, the BBC is our national broadcaster in Scotland. I think this whole chamber would believe it's time that they started to act like a national broadcaster for the whole of the country. Question number five, Richard Baker. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with CalMac regarding the future of ferry services. First Minister. Well, Transport Scotland meets regularly with CalMac, other key stakeholders, including trade unions and community representatives, to discuss how we can best deliver uh, ferry services. 
Richard Baker. Will the First Minister agree that in the process which takes place next year to replace the current contract which Carmack operates for the Clyde and Hebrides ferry services, the routes should not be debundled but tendered as a single contract as they were in the previous tendering process? First Minister. Well, we have no plans to unbundle Clyde and Hebrides ferry service. A case for unbundling, in our estimation, has not been made. But I'm sure Richard Baker will be the, the first to acknowledge and understand uh, that we have no choice uh, but to tender for these services. Uh, and I know he understands that, of course, because uh, in 2005 he supported a government motion as a government uh, supporter uh, at that time, uh, which acknowledged that the tendering of the Clyde and Hebrides lifeline ferry services is required to protect these vital services. Uh, so given that there can be no disagreement that this tendering process is inevitable, and given that I've just given him an indication of the government's view on unbundling, which should give him and the workers much security, uh, then I hope he can see that this chamber should be united in protecting our lifeline ferry services. Dave Thompson. I'm sure, First Minister, that you're aware that the Calmac ferries are predominantly crewed by West Coast seafarers. So I wonder what safeguards will be in place in the next round of tendering to ensure that these excellent staff retain their jobs and conditions of service in the long term, should Calmac lose the contract. Well, First Minister. David Thompson uh, uh, describes Calmac staff as excellent. Let me reiterate that. I think they are excellent staff employed by Calmac. And we should recognise the importance, the vital importance of these jobs to rural communities. Even if, even if following a tender process there were to be a new provider, CHUPI, of course, would apply. And I would urge all concerns to look at the protection of pensions, terms and conditions that we have managed to ensure have taken place with regard to the Northlink contract. Question number six, Linda Fabiani. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the proposed closure of the Rolls-Royce plant in East Kilbride. First Minister. Well, we appreciate the, the concern expressed uh, about the closure of East Kilbride Rolls-Royce plant on local economy and upheaval will be felt by the workers relocating to Inchinnan. However, we are pleased that Rolls-Royce intends to restrain all of its staff from the East Kilbride plant, which clearly underlines the significant contribution that these staff make to, to the company. And we also welcome Rolls-Royce's continued commitment to manufacturing in the west of Scotland. Uh, the company is committed to work closely with its employees to ensure that the proposed transition is managed uh, considerately and that Scottish Enterprise is now working closely with Rolls-Royce to ensure the relocation is managed effectively for all concerned. Scottish Enterprise and Scottish Development International are working with the company and the local partners, and this includes considering future options for the East Kilbride site in 2015 and beyond. That work is underway. The most recent meeting taking place in Shinnan on the 4th of September, for a further meeting scheduled in East Kilbride on the 20th of September. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware that back in 2004, the Labour Lib Dem administration agreed funding to upgrade the Rolls Royce plant in Renfrewshire to where the EK jobs are now proposed to move. Can I ask whether any conditions were imposed on that funding at that time to protect East Kilbride jobs and workers? And can I ask the First Minister to ensure that the Scottish Government supports efforts to retain Rolls-Royce in East Kilbride and makes every effort, as he has outlined, to secure suitable reuse of this important industrial site? Because East Kilbride has been home to some of Scotland's most advanced manufacturing and there is an absolute determination in the town to see this continue. First Minister. Well, I'll look into the, the first part of Linda Fabiani's question uh, and reply to her uh, in writing. In terms of an assurance about skills development Scotland government agencies, we'll work with local partners to ensure that all young people can access the services they need to help them into work. As she knows, the Minister of Youth uh, Employment is undertaking a series of employment action forums, including in East Kilbride, to engage young people uh, and public, private and third sectors employers to drive action uh, at a local level. She can be absolutely certain uh, that the government and its agencies are fully committed uh, to the East Kilbride economy. That ends First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a members' debate. Members who leave the chamber should leave quickly and quietly.